Hello and welcome to Tech Deals Resolution and Detail Performance Comparison. Today we are testing one game at multiple detail settings and multiple resolutions on the GTX 1080 Ti 11GB graphics card. The computer that we are testing this in today is the AMD Ryzen 7 1700X running at a fixed 4.0GHz with 16GB of DDR4 2933MHz RAM installed. The video you are watching was recorded using NVIDIA's Shadow Play. There's about a 5% performance loss on average for using the built-in recording software. Because we are testing resolutions other than 1080p today, I have to use Shadow Play because my Elgato HD60 S capture card only works at 1080p. Fraps was used for the benchmark results you'll see at the end of this video, and MSI Afterburner is used for the real-time performance numbers you see in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. Today we are playing The Division 1080p, 1440p, and 4K. This time we're only looking at ultra detail. I've done several of these videos looking at these three resolutions, and in the past I've usually done two or three different detail levels. However, The Division is now a slightly older game. It's still beautiful, it's still incredible, but it really runs very well on ultra. So rather than taking the time to do nine different runs at three different detail levels, I can use that time to test another game. Game, so I stuck to just ultra detail on this benchmark. I have, however, played enough of The Division personally. I am, after all, in one of the expansions, The Underground, because I've maxed out and finished the final story, to be able to give you an idea of how well this game plays on a variety of graphics cards. I've tested The Division on 1080s, 1070s, RX 580s, 570s, 480s, I've tested on GTX 1050 Ti's, I've tested it on laptops. I actually quite like this game, much more so than I did when I first started playing it. I started playing The Division last year purely for benchmarking purposes. I thought, well, I'll just run around the starter areas, I'll do a few things, no big deal. And then I got drawn into it, and so now here we are having finished the game, playing the downloadable content. If you look at our real-time performance numbers in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, you will notice that we are using virtually all of the graphics card's power. Not quite 100% of it, but we are darn close, 96-97%. The graphics card is running at 75 degrees Celsius, which is warm but well within normal temperatures, and the fan is turning at 63%. The actual RPM of the fan, as reported by the graphics card, is 1800 RPM. Please note that these are all stock speeds on the graphics card. I have not manually overclocked or adjusted the fan speed profile of this card. And then you can see the actual clock speed of the core chip on the card is at 1936 megahertz. How about VRAM usage? Now if you take a look at line 2, you will notice something. We are using less than three gigabytes of VRAM. I've commented on this in many other videos in the past. For 1080p gaming, you still don't need more than three gigabytes of VRAM in the vast, vast majority of situations. And all current games will play at 1080p on a three gigabyte or less card at some reasonable level of detail. There's a couple of titles that won't do it on ultra, but very, very few, and everything will do it on high. I only point this detail out because it's a common question in the comment section beneath many of my videos. How much VRAM? Do I get the 3 or 6 gig 1060? Do I get the 4 or the 8 gig RX 580 or 570? How much VRAM do we really need? Well, there certainly are a handful of games that need a lot, but frankly, most don't need as much as you might think. Now how about CPU power? This is a game that absolutely loves lots of cores and lots of CPU power. If you take a look at line 3, you'll see that our Ryzen 7 processor is bouncing between 40 and 50%. We just jumped a little bit over, but most of the time it's in the 40-ish, 45% range. Now what does this mean? Please keep in mind that this is a 16-thread processor. So half of 16, which is 8 cores, is 50%. So if we were maxing out all 8 cores, then we'd be at 50%. If we're maxing 4 cores, we'd be at 25%. These numbers are exactly half of, for example, what an i7 would be, which has eight threads, so 50% there is four cores. Now, it isn't always exactly perfect like that, but it's pretty close. It's a good ballpark estimate for how much CPU power that you're using. Certainly, if it reads 100%, then you would, in fact, be using all 16 threads because you'd be maxing your CPU out. Now, there are no games on the market today that remotely will use 16 threads, but as you can see here, there are absolutely games that will use eight of them. I want you to skip line four for a minute and come down to line five, the real time frame rate. Now we are getting anywhere between 120 all the way up to 150 frames per second. 
I have read many comments in the past from people saying that the Ryzen 7 chips don't do well in high refresh rate gaming. I don't know about you, but that looks pretty darn good to me. Now, the simple answer for this is the fact that we have eight real cores and we have a game that will use them. Now, this is not true of all games. If you get some older games in here, if we get Grand Theft Auto V, which absolutely uses four and maybe sometimes a bit more, but not much more. If you get other games in here, uh, Mass Effect Andromeda, for example, uses four very well, but it doesn't necessarily use eight. What you'll end up with is a situation where all those extra cores kind of sit dormant. However, there are newer games and even some older games which have been patched. This game, Ghost Recon Wildlands, Assassin's Creed Syndicate, and others are now starting to use these cores. If you are building a top-end gaming computer in the summer of 2017, I find it very difficult to recommend a 4-core anything chip just due to the fact that if you want high performance with a high-end graphics card, you really can make use of 8 cores these days. Now please understand I am making these comments in relation to a video testing a $750 graphics card. I would make a slightly different comment if we were testing say a $200 GTX 1063 gigabyte card, which of course would not be doing 120 to 150 frames per second because it doesn't have the compute power to do it. That would be a very different conversation. A Ryzen 5 1400 frankly would be enough for that card or a Ryzen 5 1600 would also be an excellent choice. So how much CPU you buy and how much graphics card you buy really are tied together because you don't want to overbuy one and underbuy the other. I would not, for example, install a GTX 1060 into a Ryzen 7 or even an i7. A 1070 would be the least I would install. Now, I also would not install a GTX 1080 or 1080 Ti. I cannot believe I survived this, but I actually did. Side note, look how much damage I'm taking. Look at the grenades that are being thrown against me and yes, I win this. No, I did not die. I cannot believe it. Uh, what can I say? I've gotten better at the game, or at least not sucking quite so. Would you please stop shooting me with a flamethrower? In any case, I wouldn't put this graphics card in a lower end machine either. So basically, you want to match up your graphics card with your CPU. As a general rule, your graphics card should cost at least as much, if not more, as your CPU. Now that might change over time, but at the moment, if you're gonna buy say a $300, $350 processor, that pretty much puts you into the category of a GTX 1070 or AMD's upcoming Vega processors. More is also acceptable, but I wouldn't spend any less. Likewise, if you're only spending say $200 or less on your CPU, I wouldn't put a $500 graphics card in. Three to 400 is the most I would spend. A 1070 would be fine in either, but I think a 1080 or a 1080 Ti is overkill for such a machine. Now, there are a ton of effects going on. All the fire, the grenades, the explosions. One of the reasons this is such a good replay, even though the frame rate is not as high as it otherwise could be, is due to all of that. All of that fire, all of the enemies at once really drag down the frame rate. You've seen it spike to over 150 frames per second at various points during this run, but that's during times nothing's happening. And that's the problem with benchmark charts. Benchmark charts don't tell you how the performance is when it really, really counts. Right now, when I'm facing multiple enemies, it's dipped down to like 105 to 110 frames a second. Now, that's actually spectacular. I do not misunderstand me. That's, that's wonderful and amazing and great performance. But it, we're using a 1080, we're using a $750 graphics card to get there, so... One other piece of advice I will offer, ultra detail is not necessary to have fun with the game. Lower the detail to high and you'll get much better frame rates. Why didn't I test it at both high and ultra? Time. Everything takes time. If I do that, it takes away from something else I did. This is in fact very playable. Almost forgot the loot crate, shame on me. And now we're going to transition to the 1440p run. So now we are playing at 1440p resolution. This is 2560 by 1440p. For those of you curious, um, 1440p standard is actually much closer to 1080p than it is to 4K. And I think a lot of people look at the three and figure, well, it must be right in the middle. You have 1080p as the low, you have 1440p in the middle, and then you have 4K as the high. Please note that 4K has 8.3 million pixels. 1080p has just over 2 million. 1440p has 3.6. There is only 1.6 million pixels difference between 1080p and 1440p, but there is 4.7 million pixels difference between 1440p and 4K. It is a much, much larger gap. In fact, there is a larger gap between 1440p and 4K 
then 1440p has pixels. You're more than doubling, whereas you're not even doubling making the jump to 1440p. So what is in the middle? 1440p ultra wide. The 21 by 9 ultra wide panels, such as the 34 inch screens that have 3440 across by 1440p vertical, those screens have 5 million pixels. 5 million pixels just so happens to be about 3 million less than 8 and about 3 million more than 2. So 1440p ultra wide is in fact in the middle between standard 4K and standard 1080p in terms of performance. Now why am I not testing it ultra wide? Because it's not nearly as common a monitor size as standard 1440p and the uploads wouldn't look very good to YouTube because YouTube only supports 16.9, which is what you're looking at here, whereas 21.9 would put black bars and squish the screen. However, if you want to play 1440p ultra wide, the GTX 1080 Ti is an awesome card. Yes, you can use a 1070 or a 1080, but for 5 million pixels, yes, I really would spend the money for this card. It's 35% faster. He didn't even know what hit him. It's 35% faster than the 1080 and a good 60 to 70% faster, depending upon the game, than the 1070. Now it is twice the price of the 1070, and it's not twice the performance, but you always pay a premium to be at the top end. It does have more video memory at 11 gigabytes, and it's faster video uh, memory than the 1070 does. So for twice the price of the 1070, you're getting not quite twice the performance, but you are getting the ability to keep the card for much, much longer without having to upgrade. If you buy a 1070, it'll be that much sooner that you have to take it out, sell it, put it in another machine, get another card. If you just go ahead and buy a 1080, yeah, you're paying more up front. Yeah, you're not quite getting double the performance, but you're buying longevity. You're buying the ability to use that card for an extra perhaps two years after which the 1070 would have to be replaced. I have done in the past a 1070 versus 1080 performance comparison. I have not yet done 1070 versus 1080 versus 1080 Ti. Those will be coming up soon and there's several reasons to do it. And don't worry, I will not reuse the video from the old tests. It would not be fair. Why? Because drivers have been updated, CPUs have been updated, Windows has now been uh, updated to the Creator's Edition update. Everything's been changed. So the game benchmarks that I did six months ago are not reusable. And anytime you're looking at uh, big charts of performance comparisons across multiple CPUs and multiple graphics cards, ask yourself this, were they all run on the same driver and the same version of Windows and are they current? This is one of the reasons why I don't do several of these and then put one big chart into a video combining all the runs from all the videos I've ever done. The benchmarks I did six months ago may or may not be comparable to the benchmarks that I run today. They age because Windows is always updating itself. The video drivers are always being updated. The games are often being patched. A lot of these games continue to receive ongoing performance patches. Even older games, Rise of the Tomb Raider recently just received a big patch that improved DirectX 12 performance and Ryzen performance. They updated it for Ryzen. So you cannot compare how well, say, Rise of the Tomb Raider ran six months ago on an i7 versus the way it would run at DirectX 12 on a Ryzen 7 today. And if you go search for those results and you see them side by side, you have to ask, were these tests rerun on the current version of everything? Now, if we look at our real-time performance numbers, you will see that our VRAM usage has gone up. We're now at about three and a half gigabytes of VRAM. Now, we're in the underground, so it's the same basic area with the same basic maps. It's not the exact same map, but the underground tends to be pretty consistent, and I'm probably going to keep using it for future benchmarking because it's easy and quick to run. The maps, the enemies, the distribution is all pretty similar. I think it's better in some respects than randomly running around on the street because I found that the performance varies more there, which enemies, which missions, etc. am I doing. Now please note, I am aware that the PvP areas and the dark zone are more, more demanding and run slower than say this area does. So if you are an avid player of The Division, keep in mind that certain end game components, PVP, the Dark Zone, etc., perform worse than this. But they'll perform worse at each resolution. The performance will scale down. Why don't I test PVP? I don't have any interest in PVP. I really, really don't. Not only that, but Lord, talk about inconsistent performance. 
how many enemies are being faced, which section of the dark zone are we in, how many people are on our side. It, it's, it's a challenge to benchmark PvP. Now, in games like World of Tanks, World of Warships, Overwatch, uh, etc., I don't really have any choice because that's what those games are. Okay, yes, I know Overwatch technically has a verse AI mode, but really, that's not what people want to see benchmarked. At least, I don't think it is. Overwatch is a competitive online PvP game, which is why it has to be tested that way. Now, one interesting thing you'll notice is that the CPU usage here is lower than it was on the 1080p run. Now, I fully recognize that many of you may not go out and buy $750 graphics cards to play at 1080p. After all, The Division will play at 1080p at high detail on a GTX 1060 $200 graphics card just fine. So you don't have to spend this kind of money to play at 1080p. It really is overkill. Ultra detail is nice, but not necessary. However, the CPU usage here is lower than it was on that run because the frame rate is lower. Frame rate loves CPU power. Frame rate is primarily driven by CPU power, assuming you have the graphics power to do it. What do I mean? Not everything is just graphics. Now, the graphics card draws the pretty images on the screen. It draws the triangles, it draws the environment, it lays the textures on everything but it doesn't perform collision detection, it doesn't do the AI, it doesn't do the input controls, and it doesn't generate what the triangles should be. It draws the triangles, but it doesn't actually make the world. High frame rates require lots of CPU power. All the graphics horsepower in the world will make no difference if you don't have, oh, there's a bomb. All the graphics power in the world doesn't make a lick of difference if your CPU is holding you back. So many times I'll see the question, will this graphics card bottleneck that CPU or vice versa? That depends. Do you want to run at high frame rates at low resolutions? You need lots of CPU power. Do you want to run at high resolutions but are okay with 60 frames per second? You don't need as much CPU power for that. That doesn't mean you can you know, have no CPU power, but it does mean that you don't need as much. So you'll see that the uh, actual CPU usage percentage is lower here because our frame rate is lower. Why is our frame rate lower? We're at 1440p. The graphics card has to draw 3.6 million pixels every frame. So it can never draw as many frames as it could when we were at 1080p, which is 2 million pixels per frame. This is actually a really good time to transition to the 4K run while we're talking about CPU power, and also an attempt to shorten the video because I don't want to make every game performance video I upload an hour long. In fact, I just finished yesterday afternoon, well, not from when you're watching this, but from when I voiced it over, two different one hour long game performance videos. A, they take a long time to edit and voice over. These take longer to voice over uh, than they than you do than it does to listen to them because I don't voice them over in real time. Um, I check out each section, think about what I want to say and what I want to point out, watch each section, come back, voice it over, make some edits. So I'll often spend for say an hour of voiceover work anywhere between two to three hours. Now back to the performance, take a look at the CPU usage. We are down to about 25 to 30 percent. We were at 50 percent at 1080p. What happened? Frame rates cut in half. We are below 60 frames per second. Now our VRAM usage is up, but not by much. We are only at 3.8 gigabytes of VRAM, which is up over 3.5 from 1440p. What that tells me is that this game doesn't really have 4K textures. It, it doesn't. If it did, that VRAM usage would be miles, miles higher. So while it's better and it's higher, we are not really effectively making use of the 11 gigabytes of VRAM. But again, remember The Division is not a new game and there's still plenty of games that are not getting 4K textures because how many people are playing at 4K? How many people really have 11 gigabyte VRAM video cards? Very few. In fact, even eight gigabytes is incredibly rare still. What's the most common amount of VRAM that the average gamer today in 2017 has? Two gigabytes. Yep, two. What's the second most common VRAM available today? One. Four would be the next place. However, keep in mind, that far more than 50% of all current video cards in use by gamers, at least according to the Steam Hardware Survey, are either one or two gigabyte cards. Game companies are not going to spend tens of millions of dollars developing games that only people with eight gigabyte cards can run. The percentage of people who actually have eight gigabytes or more, such as 1070s, 1080s, 1080Ti's, RX 480s, uh, RX 580s, or even the old R R9 390 and 390X that had 8GB of VRAM can be counted 
on probably one hand. It actually might be slightly over 5% at this point, but it's less than 10. So while it's nice to have the 11 gigabytes of VRAM, frankly, for most of the life of this card, half of that VRAM is gonna go completely unused even at 4K. But if you buy this card planning to keep it for three plus years, you will grow into it. There will be games two years from now, three years from now that really will start to use it, especially now that we're seeing updates to the consoles. The new Xbox One X, the Project Scorpio, that has four times the graphics performance of the Xbox One launch console that supports gaming at 4K, sort of, kind of, not really, but it, you know, it will output at 4K and it will say it's running at 4K even though it's not because it actually has RX 580 levels of graphics performance, but hey, who's counting? It will upscale. It'll play a lot of games at 1440p and it will upscale them to 4K, but it puts us in the general direction of wanting better textures and better quality. It does, by the way, interestingly enough, have more RAM than the Xbox One did. And so for displaying games at higher resolutions, for inducing game companies to come out with higher texture detail to use VRAM, note that the Xbox One X does in fact have more RAM in it than the Xbox One does allowing game companies to make versions of their game with higher textures. Of course, what's happening there is that we're gonna end up with two versions of the same game. One requirement Microsoft has is that any game that runs on an Xbox One X must also run on the Xbox One. Oh boy, could they have not made that more confusing. In any case, so the Xbox One X has four times the graphics performance and about 35 to 40% more CPU power than the launch Xbox One, and it has 50% more RAM. It's combined RAM, and it's faster. The launch version had DDR3. They finally put GDDR5 RAM, so the RAM is phenomenally faster. You have more of it. You have four times the graphics performance. Games will look much better. Well, they will if they're updated or designed for it. What will probably happen now is that games will come with two different sets of textures. They'll come with higher resolution textures and a few extra details so they will look better and shinier at higher resolution on an Xbox One X, but they can load the lower resolution textures and the simplified models to play on an original Xbox One. Boy, that sounds an awful lot like PC gaming, doesn't it? Gee, wasn't console gaming supposed to be simple where basically you bought a console and everything played on it and it looked the same no matter what you did and the performance was the same no matter what you did? While they have to make the games work on the original Xbox One, and they will for a while, don't be surprised if a year or two from now, games perform better. They do 60 frames per second on the Xbox One X and only 30 frames per second on the Xbox One. So now consoles are kind of getting that division like the way PC games have had since basically forever. If there is any cloud to that silver lining, it's this. If game companies are gonna create 4K versions of their game to look nice and shiny on the Xbox One X console and whatever the PlayStation 4 comes out with to compete with it, assuming it does, then that means that they will have already developed them and can drop them into their PC ports of their games. Keep in mind that most of these games these days are really developed for console first, PC second. Wonderful quality PC ports. So what that essentially means, yeah, you can run, but you can't hide. I got you with my 50,000 damage with one shot. Sweet, 46, that is a nice, I like this rifle. In any case, so what this means is that over the next couple of years, you will start to see the VRAM being used. No, you don't have to have 11 gigs. The eight gigabyte cards will be fine, but it does mean that three years from now, if you're interested in playing AAA gaming titles and you wanna play them at high quality detail settings, three and four gigabyte cards will probably be, not be enough. Now, some of you will hear that and go, wait a minute, I, I thought we could keep those cards for a while. You can, but then how are we supposed to play at ultra detail? Okay, let's take a GTX 1060 for a minute. Let's give it 20 gigs of VRAM just for the sake of fun. All right, now we're gonna advance three years into the future. So you can play games at ultra detail, right? No, you won't be able to. Why? It won't have the compute horsepower. It won't have the CUDA cores, the computational capability to play games at that detail setting. It'll have plenty of VRAM. It will look gorgeous. All the textures will load into VRAM and it will run at five frames per second. So it's worth noting that just increasing VRAM does not make a game play if it needs more compute power. So does that mean that I think that the six and eight gigabyte versions of the 1060 and RX 580 are a waste? No, they are a price premium, but not much of one. If you can find the higher gigabyte versions of those cards, the 580 and the 1060 in the 30 to $40 range, they're worth paying. I would be comfortable with paying 
$30, maybe $40 at the most price premium to jump from 3 to 6 gigs on the 1060 or from 4 to 8 on the RX 580. I would not pay more. When the 1060 launched, for example, there was a $60 price premium between the 3 and the 6 gig card. It's not worth $60 for that because the card will age out for compute power at some point and you're paying $60 for what? One extra detail setting in terms of texture quality? Oh, fair enough, I can appreciate that. But keep in mind that unless you have all the money in the world, in which case you aren't buying a 1060 or 580 anyway, that $60 could go to your solid state drive. It could go to your processor. It could go to a nicer case or a nicer cooler for your CPU for overclocking. The question is not, is that extra VRAM useful or is that card faster? It's what else could the money buy? $60, for example, will upgrade you from a 250 gigabyte solid state drive to a 500 gigabyte solid state drive. Not only are the 500 gigabyte versions of the SSDs generally faster than the 256 gig versions, but the extra space will mean that you can install more games, more programs, you'll run out of space further into the future, and basically just have a better overall machine. So it's ultimately a personal choice as to what you buy. Actually, I think the sweet spot at the moment really has moved on from the GTX 1060. I think we're starting to move to the 1070. And when I was doing this voiceover, they actually were in short supply due to the current crypto mining craze. A couple of weeks ago, you could find some crazy good deals on the GTX 1070 and even the RX 580. When the RX 580 launched, you could buy eight gigabyte versions of the RX 580 for $220 on Newegg. And at the time, there was only a $20 price difference between the four and the eight gig ver versions of those cards. And I said at the time, Lord, for $20, this is a no brainer. You buy the eight gig version all day long. Done, easy, simple, do it. And $220 for an RX 588 gig is a great deal. It's a great card. Now it's not as fast as a 1070, but for $220, that's a great price. Good luck finding one for that price today. Now, if you're watching this video far in the future, you may have missed the entire cryptocurrency craze. Bitcoin values are up and the RX 580s and even now 1070s are getting very hard to find for a reasonable price due to the fact that they are being bought up hundreds at a time by cryptocurrency miners. You can actually use them to mine these coins, which if you're not familiar with them is basically mathematical calculations that can be exchanged for money because people think they're worth money and I guess maybe they are if people think they are, but what it does is it makes it hard to find them for gamers. As of the date of me doing the voiceover of this video, every single um, RX 570, 580, 470 and 480 was out of stock at Newegg, at Amazon, and pretty much everywhere else online that you could go search for. These things are selling for nearly double retail price on eBay at the moment, and they are selling. Look at the completed and sold uh, listings for the fact that they are in fact selling. What this actually brings up is an interesting point. If you own an RX 480 or 580, especially uh, one of the nicer cards, you might actually consider selling it, spend a bit of money, and trade up to a GTX 1080. You can currently buy GTX 1080s, not the TI, but the 1080, for under $500 on Newegg. If you can sell your RX 480 or 580 for, say, $400, and replace it with a 1080 for $500, that's a deal. Maybe I should do a video on that. In any case, let's go take a look at the results. And here we are at the results. Now, if you use the timestamps in the video description below to skip ahead to this, I understand. At least watch a minute or two of each card to see the real time frame rate to better understand these numbers. Let's start with the green bars. These are the average frame rates. We had 139 frames per second at 1080p, 102 frames per second average at 1440p, and 55 frames per second average at 4K. Why the huge drop off? Well, I talked about that in detail during the runs. Be sure to go back and watch them if you missed it. But essentially, the drop from 1080p to standard 1440p is not that bad. If you had a 1440p ultra wide, you'd probably be looking around 80 frames per second just to give you an idea of the drop off for the jump from 1440p standard to 1440p ultra wide. As far as 4K goes, if you want to play the division at 4K high detail, Yes, it will run at ultra, but look at the dips down to 41 and 31 on the minimums. I strongly, strongly recommend you move it to high detail. The performance will jump up noticeably. You'll add 15 to 25 frames per second on those three bars, and it will become completely playable. This simply shows the difference between ultra 
And the only reason I didn't do high is because high detail at 1080p on this graphics card is a bit silly. You become completely CPU bound and it doesn't show the performance. So this shows the drop off curve, but play 4K at high detail. Now the red bars and the blue bars are 1% and 0.1% minimum numbers. In short, I think you should focus on the red bars. They're the ones that represent the performance you will get at a minimum 99% of the time. The blue ones just take it a decimal place further and are closer to the true minimum. So at 1080p at ultra detail, we'll get at least 93 frames per second, 99% of the time. Of course, way higher than that most of the time. At 1440p ultra, we'll get at least 73 frames per second, 99% of the time. And at 4K, we get 41, which does get kind of rough. Now, I would like to make one very clear point. If you want to play at 1080p, you don't need a 1080 Ti. You can absolutely play the division on a 1060 or RX 570 or 580 at high detail, and you'll get about 60 frames a second. You won't be getting 139, but you'll get 60-ish plus frames per second on 200 to $250 cards, at least if you can find any with the current crypto. Uh, mining craze going on. As far as 1440p, I would personally step up to a GTX 1070. It does have a solid 50% performance jump over the lower end cards, and at 1440p, I think that's very valuable. And frankly, at high detail, this game will play just fine at 4K on a GTX 1080 non-TI card. Now, it's going to dip below 60 frames a second in doing that, and you might want to turn anti-aliasing completely off because at 4K, I don't think it's as important but you don't have to spend $750. The whole point here is to simply show you if you are gonna spend 750, what can it do in the division? I hope this video was helpful and useful to you. Click that like button, share this video with your friends. Remember to subscribe to my channel. Check the video description for links to everything in this video. Please consider supporting me on Patreon. Links down in the description below if you are able to. If not, liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting is also appreciated. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in my next video.